Good morning. I think we're ready to start. Welcome to uh, another Microdesk webinar here about work management uh, to cognitive insights uh, with the discussion about asset management in the 21st century. So the agenda that we have for today's session is a short introduction, a little definition about what asset management is. Uh, when we search for the, the future of asset management, what exactly does it mean and what, what do we get return, or returned when we, when we look for information about asset management? What are the overall trending topics in the industry? Um, where is everything going with asset management? And then we'll do a little dive into the future and then show you how to start building the future. So myself, um, George Broadbent, I'm the Director of Asset Management for Microdesk. My background is in mechanical engineering, uh, which then moved into systems and information architecture, uh, which I've spent the last 25 years doing. Um, enterprise asset management is sort of an extension of information management and information architecture. And I've done that work for clients such as Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, Danone, Stanford University Healthcare, AstraZeneca, uh, so pretty wide variety of large institutions that I've worked with in the past. Who we are, uh, Microdesk is a global AECO consulting firm. We have um, offices in London. Uh, we have project offices in Europe. We're in South America, we're in Asia. Um, and then we started off in the United States where we currently have 12 office locations. We are both IBM business partners and Autodesk Platinum partners, which makes us somewhat unique in the industry because we're able to actually look at information, um, graphics, details, data, how it comes from uh, inception all the way through operations. Our Services are comprised of four distinct areas, as-built modeling, construction services, managed services, and then my group, which is the enterprise asset management. Um, the as-built modeling uh, is, and the construction services all actually feed into enterprise asset management. We, we, we always talk about beginning with the end in mind. Uh, so the as-built modeling process, the construction services, all have data that operations needs, and we'll dive into that a little bit more in the presentation. Some of our clients include um, Denver International Airport, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, um, the New York New Jersey Link, Stanford Healthcare, um, Columbia University. These are all clients that I've been working with recently uh, in the area of asset enterprise asset management. And so let's go through what a definition is of asset management. There's two distinct terms that are out there in the industry, asset and facilities management. And, and they're sometimes used interchangeably. But we want to draw a distinction here, especially for this presentation, that we're going to be talking about asset management. So asset management is systematic and coordinated activities and practices for an organization for equipment related systems where you're able to understand performance risk expenditures over the life cycle of the equipment. Okay, so it's very equipment focused uh, in terms of enterprise asset management. How do you balance the risks with your organizational needs and uh, understand the costs associated with those assets? Facilities management, on the other, on the other hand, is very, very similar, um, but it's really looking for how to um, maintain the space, the building or the properties uh, in which uh, support uh, or improve the organizational strategic plan. So both are related to the strategic plan for the organization, but um, today's discussion is going to be focused mostly around asset management. 
to that end, what is an asset? Um, so we have a we have a basic definition that we use for an asset itself. Uh, so if the item, meaning a piece of equipment, um, can be refurbished or rebuilt, uh, then it qualifies as an asset. If it can be taken offline and repaired, uh, some kind of documented calibration associated with it, certifications needed to maintain it, there's a financial depreciation associated with it, um, it must be used as a part of a safety plan. So this is a very IBM Maximo specific terminology here. But really what it refers to is something that is um, a part of your uh, health and safety plan for maintaining a piece of equipment. Then it must be considered as an asset. Um, and if it must be tracked and reported by an external entity, so if there's a regulatory entity that is uh, requiring you to report on this on this piece of equipment, then you, know, you must consider it as an asset. And the, these these definitions are critical because it really goes towards uh, um, how do we capture the information about it, how do we track the information about it, and then what are we tracking about that piece of equipment. So when we look for terms about the future of asset management. Okay, what what does asset management mean in the 21st century? So you, you go to Google and you put in some basic search terms like asset management in the 21st century or asset management trends or uh, the future of asset management. And you start to get terms like, okay, asset management, enterprise, uh, market, revenue, solutions, data. It, it's not really telling you too much. So, but as you continue to search, again, you, you know, you start to um, remove some terms. Like if you take out the um, terms of that asset management, then we look at EAM, industry, global assets, revenue, market. Again, but it's not really giving us a true map or an indication of what is the future. Um, so, you know, this search here was rather interesting here in that um, if you'll notice that one of the search terms that came back was COBOL. Uh, well, that's clearly not a future trend, um, but it is, uh, it, it does show the problem with trying to figure out what is the future based upon just searches um, and information that's out there. So what we have to look at is what are the, the trending topics? And these topics are areas of discussion that we have with our customers. These are um, topics that come up in conferences. These are topics that come up with organizations like the Institute of Asset Management. And so these topics include things like BIM, okay, building information modeling. Um, how is it? used in asset management? Where can it be used in asset management? Does it even play a role in, in asset management? Integrated project delivery, IPD. Um, this is another popular topic. The ISO standards are an ever-present topic amongst um, discussions around what is the future of asset management. Data management. Uh, is ever present as well. It really lies towards you know what is the the information that we're gathering and how are we gathering it. Uh, digital twins is a relatively new term to the to the marketplace, and the digital twin we're going to we're going to dive into that pretty deeply is um, is one that I think is is the most exciting um, term to describe the future of asset management. Uh, and then we have predictive analytics. We have just analytics in itself. And then there's there's topics like blockchain. Um, our cryptocurrencies are, are based on blockchain, but now people are looking at how can they extend blockchain into our uh, facility operations. So in the, in the area of BIM, uh, there's been a lot of promise, uh, especially in the area of operations. So the traditional workflow that we look at from, from for BIM 
always has a knowledge loss at each stage and a big knowledge gap. Um, and the BIM workflow is supposed to solve all this. The BIM workflow is supposed to give us continuous information with no information loss. However, the reality is uh, what we're seeing with the BIM workflow is that there is a knowledge gap that is almost as significant as the traditional workflow uh, when it comes to operations. There's a, there's a huge gap in the handoff between construction and operations. Um, but this is something that we need that has great potential for operations. Uh, there's a lot of information that's captured in the BIM process that is needed and useful in operations, and it's going to, um, it, it, in terms of like a future trend, it's going to be something that we need um, we need going forward. The next thing is is you know the next sort of big hype area is the Internet of Things. What is it? It is you know sensor data connected devices, uh, interconnected um, machines, uh, and understanding of what it is that's happening to that machine in real time. Um, and you know this is this is great uh, marketing. This is great um, hype to a certain degree. Um, but there's a there's a practical side to the Internet of Things. You know, we can cover that in another in another webinar. We'll dive into that. But knowing that it is it is something that is needed as a part of operations, um, but in uh, in certain areas. Um, but really, what you know, what are customers talking about today? Um, when it comes to operations, these are the topics that that come up every single day. Um, how do I optimize my costs? How do I manage my inventory? How do I control my energy costs? Energy costs are through the roof for mo most organizations. Um, what do I have in terms of an inventory? Um, how well are my assets that, that are public facing, customer facing, performing? And, and how am I doing with regulatory compliance? These are the issues that keep up uh, keep operations people up at night. These are the issues that, that mean the most to them. These are the issues that have the biggest impact on their bottom line. So we have to look at how we can take the trending topics, these, these discussion areas, and the real discussions that are going on and merge them together to come up with a real solution for the 21st century. However, a couple of things that we do know, uh, when you're looking at what the future is, um, it's also good to know what is not the future. Uh, and these things are not the future. Paper-based filing systems um, is, is something of, it, it, it is the past. It is definitely not the future. It is definitely not the future trend. We all have rooms like this. We all have areas in our facilities that are stockpiled with paper, but the amount of time and energy uh, that is wasted looking through these things to find the most relevant current pieces of information um, is, uh, is a mind-boggling number for organizations. Uh, so that is, the, um, that is definitely not a part of the future trends for us. And then this is another one here that's not a part of the future trends. Um, this is an interesting quote from a facility managers that it, it takes 24 hours to replace a light bulb, meaning that by the time you um, identify the light bulb, do the paperwork, schedule the crew, have the crew go out there, replace the light bulb, they have spent 24 hours just to replace that light bulb. This is low work order productivity. Um, parts mismatched, um, inspections that are needed to, to verify what's in your systems. These are all things that are definitely not a part of the future trends. 
And, and then you know, we'll look at these uh, we'll look at these equipment failures later on in the presentation as well. This is another critical area um, to look at because what this is, is talking about here is um, you know, at the end of construction and when a, when a piece of equipment first goes into service, it has a very high potential of failure in the beginning months of its life. Think of it when you have a car, uh, when you buy a new car, something generally speaking will happen that makes you go back to the dealership uh, within the first month, um, maybe within the first three months, but something happens. It doesn't necessarily mean that the uh, the piece of equipment has has completely failed, but that there is a there is a touch point required in that um, in, within that first uh, few months of its operations. And what happens is um, what's shown on the chart and below is that the uh, at the end of major construction we have somewhere in the middle. Uh, operations gets the data about the equipment that's being delivered and this is typically can stretch out to somewhere around 18 months for organizations. Some organizations are lucky where it's six months, some of them it's 12. For the most part though it's around the 18 month mark when the data about what the equipment is gets, at, it gets delivered. And what happens is operations is working during this time so we call this period the operational blind spot. And the operational blind spot is when uh, operators don't know what they have, but the equipment is failing or requires a touch point. And that costs time and money for organizations to, to be able to go in and touch those pieces of equipment because you've got to research about the equipment itself. So this is definitely not a part of the future trends for the asset management systems of the 21st century. But let's look at today. Let's look at what we have in place today that we can use uh, and leverage going forward. So work management systems, CMMS, computerized maintenance management systems, uh, have been around for a very long time. Uh, they are asset centric, meaning that you, know, you have a piece of equipment that, that conforms to the rules uh, of an asset. Um, you're able to do planning, scheduling, work management, assess condition on it, uh, do meters, which means I can record um, temperature, vibrations, uh, I can record uh, flow rates, anything like that with metering. I know what resources are needed. Uh, I know what the health and safety plans are for maintaining that equipment. Uh, there's a supply chain associated with it and then there's materials associated with it. And then what you're seeing on the right-hand side there in the boxes is um, all the different components that go into these different areas that, that support the asset. Um, so we have things like service level, we have failure readings, we have uh, replenishment, we have item kits, vendors. Okay, all of these things are supporting components or services that go into the asset itself. These are all recorded uh, as a part of the asset. And so what happens is the CMMS system gets used for tracking work orders, recording asset history, managing the inventory, scheduling tasks, doing external work requests, and, and audits and certifications. Um, CMMS, and meaning an asset-centric uh, focus on the system, it allows us to operate and maintain the facility. But today we're able to actually integrate our BIM process with the CMMS. And so what happens is the facility gets a view of uh, how the, the facility was constructed in a BIM model. We get to see what the properties are of those pieces of equipment. And then we also get the documents that are associated with those, with those pieces of equipment, uh, meaning like warranties, submittal data, um, maintenance and inspection information, uh, PDFs, so forth. So all that information then gets av made available to 
operations as a part of having the CMMS system integrated with the BIM model. And, and what that allows us to do is actually start to look at things like air systems and look at you know, airflow along each section of the air system, breaking it down, coming up with an understanding of how the entire air system comes together. And, and, and that is going to allow us uh, uh, to look at what is the future. And, and so really what you were looking at is uh, asset management in the 21st century is standards-based. So we need to use the ISO 55000 standards as a fundamental component of our asset management system going forward. This is the ISO standards allows us to define where asset management fits within the organization. Data dictionaries are now becoming standard practice in that they're going to define what's the common language for all the systems, meaning that we have the ability to say, I have, um, at its simplest form, make, model, manufacture, and serial number captured as a part of this piece of equipment, and it is going to be delivered by the contractor, by the commissioning agents, or by the facility operations staff. We get to define who's delivering the data, what the data is, and what's the end goal of that data. Um, and then BIM to FM uh, is the digital twin, uh, as we started talking about before. Digital twin meaning that it is the it is the digital representation of the real world environment. Um, in engineering speak, this is sometimes referred to as as-built models. Um, they're sometimes referred to as LOD 500 models. They are sometimes referred to as drawings of record. Um, but the digital twin actually goes a little bit further in that it is actually the, the, the true digital duplicate of the entire environment. So you can look at things like your balanced air system and see, you know, see what your flow rates are, make changes to the system, and then see how uh, your system is affected all in the digital model. Um, cognitive is your AI-driven decisions and insights. Artificial intelligence is going to be a key player in the future of asset management. Um, machine learning, um, predictive analysis, all of these things fall into the category of cognitive. And cognitive allows us to look at what will happen based upon multiple sources of data. And how do we get those multiple sources of data? Well, that's where sensors come in. Okay, and this is where the Internet of Things plays a key role in the future of asset management. Um, so sensors allow us to establish what are the baseline conditions. So we have from our BIM model a baseline of what the manufacturer is calling for. But then the sensors actually give us the real world conditions. So system is installed, sensors give us the baseline, and now we have something to understand uh, when and, and if there is a change to that environment. Um, and then finally, um, augmented reality is going to play a huge role within asset management in the 21st century in that it is um, going to allow us to do teleoperations uh, and assisted operations. So teleoperations is not like teleoperate, uh, which is a, a remote control of a machine, but teleoperations is similar to telemedicine, where you are the human operator talking to another human operator who is looking at a piece of equipment. And then you are guiding that person as to how to maintain that piece of equipment. That's teleoperations. Um, and then assisted operations in an augmented reality sense is where you're able to look at a piece of equipment and then 
the cognitive system, the AI system, the maintenance management system can feed you information about that piece of equipment that you're looking at. You can look at flow rates, you can look at temperatures, you can look at vibration, you can look at what the current operating state is of that piece of equipment. This is going to be a huge, huge part of operations going forward. So what does tomorrow look like? You know, this is a um, simple a, a diagram as I could come up with to give one picture for the future. What we have is, starting on the, on this, in the middle here, sensor-based data. Okay, this is our Internet of Things. This is where we're able to look at things like um, pressure differential. If we look at pressure differential, that information, the, the P1, P2 information, is going to be stored someplace so that we can look at the trends going forward. So this becomes now a part of uh, our big data warehouse, storing all this information about each sensor, temperature, vibration, humidity, um, and, and looking at all of these different sensors and all these different sources. When the big data component to that is then going to feed our AI engine. Um, the artificial intelligence systems of today uh, and for the foreseeable future need lots of data in order to be able to draw conclusions. Um, now the big data system as well is going to need to feed our maintenance management system based upon certain rules. So when the flow rate changes to more than, let's say, 20% differential from baseline, then the CMMS system kicks in and creates um, a work order. This is called actionable information for the CMMS system. This actionable information allows us to direct the field staff to look at this piece of equipment and see why it's, it's underperforming, why it's maybe using it excessive power, so forth. Um, and then this is where the augmented reality system comes into play because the field staff are going to use the augmented reality system to look at the piece of equipment and overlay on top of it things like a BIM model, overlay on top of it information from the CMMS system, uh, overlay on top of it information about how the equipment is supposed to operate. Uh, so here, in this one, one section here of this diagram, you see how BIM, CMMS, and human interaction comes together in one place um, within facility operations. But then going back on the right-hand side here, um, any kind, any time that there's work being done in the field, there are usually spare parts, there's inventory management that has to be done. Um, so inventory management comes from the supply chain um, and the supply chain is going to be controlled by blockchain. Um, blockchain is taking over supply chains around the world and so it's going to allow us to um, understand where the material is coming from, that it was the true part for the piece of equipment and that it was sourced correctly uh, and that it's made its way into our inventory um, and, is, and then it's been integrated in with the CMMS system. And then above it all is the master control system, as I call it, which allows us to look at, you know, insights and analytics across the entire operations. Of course, what we're looking at here in this diagram here is just one particular piece of an entire operation. Multiply this out over thousands and thousands of assets, and you can see how complicated that, that picture starts to get. So this master control system allows us to take a broad swath look at the entire system and how, how everything works. We then get to look at financial risk and operational performance, which are all the components of, of an asset management system. Now, getting to that point is going to be difficult. Um, 
So we can't get to tomorrow without starting today. And so how do we get there? So looking at how we move from the past into the future, so yesterday and even today, to a large extent, we have flat 2D drawings. So the transition technology, the transition for that is BIM. Uh, um, BIM is going to uh, slowly take over um, the world of 2D drawings. It will replace those um, rooms that we have in the basement filled with flat 2D drawings. Um, and, and then the future is really taking BIM to the next level and creating the digital twin of our facilities and our operations. Work management um, today, for the most part, is calendar-based. Uh, and in some cases, it is a run-to-failure model. Um, the transition is, is what many organizations are doing, which is reliability center maintenance, um, asset performance-based uh, maintenance, uh, looking at how well the assets are performing and when it is that we need to do maintenance on them. Um, and then the future is a predicted failure model and where we are able to minimize the reactive events. Um, so predictive failure is really a function of an AI system, um, and that's going to be prevalent throughout all of our operations. Um, the other area is that, that group think or experience-based view, um, sometimes referred to as tribal knowledge and understanding how the facility operates, where it's operating, what it's doing. Um, that's going to be supplanted with things like virtual reality training. Uh, it's going to be replaced with things like teleoperations, where you're going to be able to have one experienced person in the background guiding the newer staff and under, so that they can understand what, what is happening in the facility. Um, virtual reality training is going to allow you to um, have the staff walk through the facility before it's fully in operations. Uh, and then the future is cognitive insights, predictive and analytics, and then you know true uh, integrated augmented reality. Um, augmented reality is a wonderful technology, but without the content to support augmented reality, um, it, it doesn't. It, we will never see the, the true promise of it. So augmented reality really requires the digital twin. It requires the sensors. It requires a CMMS system uh, in order for it to fully, um, for us to fully realize its capabilities. So let's go and look at the future itself and what does that mean? So as we can see, even in the 23rd century, uh, there is maintenance. Scotty, the ever-loving miracle worker of the enterprise, what what is what I found interesting here was that even in the 23rd century, even in the the future of science science fiction, uh, maintenance is a key part of uh, science fiction. There are maintenance crews. There are people repairing the facility. There are people understanding like when is this piece of equipment going to break? Okay, and this really highlights for me what the future looks like. We're, we're not going to get away from maintenance, but it's being able to understand what it is that has to be done and being able to fix it before it breaks is really the, the, uh, really the future for us. So part of the future is uh, something we call the BIM to FM guidelines. Um, we're all familiar with BIM execution plans. And but the BIM guidelines is really the way in which the owner gets to represent 
what their intent is for BIM. So if the intent is for BIM to become the digital twin of their facility, then they need to state that in the overarching guidelines. And the execution plans are then there to support the BIM guidelines. Um, so think of it as your, your master contract, um, and then the execution plans are your uh, tasks within that, ma that master contract. So the guidelines have your data dictionary, your contract language, your operational goals, i.e. digital twin, and then your asset hierarchy locations, okay, how it is that you are going to track the assets, where is the asset going to be placed within your, your future system. And then from that, your FM model is derived, your asset data is derived, and that all feeds your asset management system and your operational data delivery. So again, you know, critical component here for um, getting to the future of um, digital twins being able to understand how this all comes together. Um, so when BIM and FM are, in, are integrated together, um, then operations is driving integrated project delivery. Um, operations becomes a part of the beginning of the process, um, and IPD is extended into operations. So the digital twin uh, is is most easily represented here in these these graphics where um, we are able to design something, i.e. a car. That design is fed into the manufacturing process, the build process, and into the operations process. And all and there's feedback loops throughout the entire process in order to uh, capture the real, um, really what was actually built in the end and what is actually operating. Um, same thing holds true for buildings, being able to understand here was the design intent, here's the construction model, but then as the model is, as the facility is constructed, capturing the, uh, the real world conditions that are happening in the digital model. Digital twins are sometimes also represented um, in our 4D analysis, uh, but the key here is being able to say, this is what is actually existing in the real world. Again, it goes to the term as-built model, um, and that's a very engineering-centric term, but um, digital twin really represents what it is, what's in the real world for us. So, with the digital twin, you can start to ask questions like, what if I could? So I can look at product management. I can look at manufacturing, um, real-time alerts on quality assurance information to, to look at root cause analysis for uh, why something is going the way it should or it was designed to go. Um, look at the impact of design changes on costs quality, manufacturer, user experience. Um, look at, you know, engage with engineering to resolve issues um, and, and start to do the what-if scenarios uh, for, um, for the issues that are coming up and trying to figure them out um, before they actually go into operations. Um, one, and the key thing here is that when you try to make a change to a system, building a fighter jet, a uh, uh, any kind of facility uh, in operations. When you make try to make that change in operations, it's always more expensive than if you were to make that change during the design and construction process. So, build the digital twin, do your what if analysis, introduce those feedback loops, so that you can you can improve upon the design, you can improve upon what was constructed uh, before it's actually built. Um, and then work with engineering to do predictive models to be able to produce, prioritize true critical maintenance, meaning uh, identify what your assets are before they're actually in operations. 
And then the Internet of Things, um, we talked a little bit about that before. It's all sensor-based. I like this this description here because uh, we you know we all deal with cars you know every day, and that cars are now uh, really sensor platforms, um, fluid levels, throttle positions, crankshaft speeds, um, switches, windows, everything you know it has a sensor associated with it to say a door is open, the, trunk, you know, the boot is open. Um, accelerator, pedal position, transmission gear position. Everything is sensor-based in a car. Uh, and this can extend out into our facilities as well. Now, what happens is when you take the digital twin and you take IoT, uh, it, it adds value in, to asset management by, by accomplishing a number of different things. So we're able to reduce our maintenance costs by up to 25%. We're eliminating 70% of breakdowns, reducing downtime by 50%, cutting unplanned outages by up to 50%. And I have some statistics on this here. I'll show you in a second as well. Um, reduce schedule repairs by up to 12%, and reduce capital investment by 3 to 5%. These are all tremendous savings for operations. So predictive analysis is um, really looking at um, the likelihood of asset failure and timing of failure based upon statistical model modeling. When you when you start to look at equipment and you start to look at uh, different sensors that are going into those pieces of equipment, there's a lot. There's obviously there's a lot of data that that's coming out of those sensors. Um, and being able to filter through the, the data to identify the real trend is uh, what a predictive and analytic system can do. Um, it can also recommend optimal maintenance schedules and maintenance procedures, again, reducing your scheduled maintenance cost. Um, and then, you know, ongoing optimization through machine learning. Uh, so. As the, as the system collects more data, and as you put more data into the system, uh, meaning like physical work that's being done on the system, it will get smarter. Uh, uh, but we have to look at, you know, we always have to take into consideration how Quinn fails. So these models have been around for 30 years. Um, three basic models of how Quinn fails. So the one that we looked at earlier, which was the leading curve for equipment failure, meaning that you have a high probability of failure within the beginning months of a piece of equipment's life. Another one is um, sort of very intuitive, where the equipment fails towards the end of the life of uh, the, the equipment. And then you have the ones which are you know, sometimes referred to as a lemon, where you have a high probability of failure in the beginning and a high probability of failure at the end. Okay, this is the classic bathtub curve here. All of these equipment failures lead us to what we call reactive maintenance. Now, reactive maintenance is um, unplanned. It's an unexpected failure, and this is that's a key term here. Um, emergency work. Uh, critical issues due to weather. However, when we when we look at reactive maintenance, we look at things. Um, we we sometimes look at it as well. We can't we can't do anything to reactive maintenance. We can't control reactive maintenance um, because it is just that we don't know when it's going to fail. However, we've seen before that the the introduction of an AI system was going to allow us to predict when something is going to fail. So therefore, the unexpected failure becomes no longer becomes an issue for us because we're able to predict when it's going to fail, and we can we can plan the replacement of the equipment during regular maintenance hours. Now, what does it look like for um, reactive maintenance? What is the actual cost of reactive maintenance? Uh, so we have, in this case here, two facilities. 
uh, of about 4.2 million square feet. And we have a average of 7,500 assets across all of these facilities with roughly 32 maintenance staff um, that are scheduled to do the work. And this model that we've built allows us to say, okay, if we have a, if we have 7,500 assets and we understand what the, what the probability of failure is of a piece of equipment, we can come up with how many corrective work orders are needed and then what's the total time that's required for each incident. Um, and then we know our staff, we know our maintenance costs, so, so then we can actually put a number to what our corrective maintenance work order is, work is before the facility is actually in operations. So in this case here, so what we look at here is that, okay, in the first month, we're gonna spend um, 2,000 hours, potentially 2,000 hours uh, on uh, maintenance doing corrective work. Um, total cost over 12 months is something around in the order of a half a million dollars that we're going to be spending for the um, unplanned, unpredicted emergency corrective work that has to be done. And this is where, this is where the, the cognitive systems can have a direct impact on facility operations. So what we're looking at here is how does the cognitive system understand power, pressure, speed, flow, and what it can do at this point is it can predict um, that the motor is trending to failure in five days. You know, a human can do this. A human can do this on each piece of equipment, but to do this continuously, 24 hours a day, um, over the 7,500 assets that you have, you need to have an AI system in place that's going to do all, the, all of those calculations and trendings for you over time. So, you know, again, the, the cognitive system is going to look at, you know, when does the, when does the trend break uh, and then come up with a predictive uh, 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 model for you know, when complete failure is going to occur, and then send out alerts associated with that. Um, again, you know, predictive analysis allows you to uh, predict exactly when something is going to fail. So how do we start building the future? So uh, we said before that we need to start uh, with the end in mind. As part of the, the the BIM process is one of the linchpins for the future of asset management systems. So we need to define responsible staff to manage and maintain the BIM models and data internally. Um, this can be a combination of internal and external staff, but there needs to be some group within there that's going to maintain the models going forward. Um, you need to develop a data dictionary. This is one of the tools that we have for data dictionaries where we're able to look at what's the asset, what is the functional area for the asset, the system that it belongs to, and then what phase of work is that data that's associated with it going to be collected. And then you have to ensure smooth transition to operations. So the BIM methodology defines the process, the data, what all the deliverables are for the construction. And we have to understand that the BIM data that's generated is useful, um, it's needed in operations, and then the 3D models and floor plans are absolutely needed in operations. It's, it's a critical piece to ongoing operations. And it will replace those rooms of flat 2D uh, drawings in the near future. So, one of, the, one of the ways that we do this is through a software called ModelStream. Uh, it's our own internal software. Um, it's a product that we have that allows us to manage the data transition. Um, so when you put BIM at the center of the process, your design, 
construction, commissioning, uh, all the way through operations and maintenance, BIM feeds every, comp every part of this process. So the, the key here, though, is that the data transition process, in this case here, um, is used through model stream, feeding into an IBM Maximo system. This allows us to um, have continuous data and common data uh, throughout the life cycle of the facility. So what model stream does is we'll actually take the assets out of the BIM model uh, and create and update them within a Maximo system, uh, creates a location hierarchy, all based upon the data, and it's bi-directional as well. Because again, you're, you're looking at a digital twin and you need a feedback model for that digital twin to reflect current conditions. And that's where model stream comes in, into play and it allows us to create that feedback by doing bi-directional synchronization between the two systems. And in the end, what happens is um, this uh, digital twin that you're looking at here for, or in this case here, an HVAC system actually gets embedded within the maintenance management system, in this case IBM Maximo, uh, so that you can look at an asset and look at exactly where that asset's located and all the attributes associated with it. And then cognitive with the IoT system, uh, we've kind of touched on this before. Um, IoT connects the devices, gateways and endpoints. It, it looks at um, uh, it, it, big data and we're able to do that through cloud-based services. Um, cognitive allows us to uh, look at data, trends, um, and it, it's able to learn from the data um, and learn from the trends uh, to actually come up with predictive models uh, for the future. Cognitive IoT uh, then allows us to look at um, video, imagery, audio, uh, text, machine learning, natural language processing, um, and, and come up with uh, a set of analytics that allows us to predict um, in real time what is happening with your systems. So, you know, basically this is showing here that, you know, cognitive IoT is going to reduce the time for verification of design, improve the quality monitoring, uh, expedite service calls and repairs, and reduce warranty costs. It's doing all this because we're able to actually not let the, not let everything fail on our on our systems. We're able to uh, predict when it's going to fail, repair it while it's still in service. Um, maybe it's as simple as a as a part that needs to be replaced, as opposed to an entire piece of equipment that needs to be re replaced after failure. Um, so it looks at equipment data, sensor data exogenous data like weather. Um, weather has a huge impact on uh, facility operations. Uh, and so um, a hot summer day uh, is different from a cold, damp uh, fall day uh, in terms of how, how pieces of equipment operate. And humans are not necessarily that good at, at identifying trends over the long term based upon uh, point pieces, point sources of data, meaning when it was 85 degrees last year, this happened to this piece of equipment. Um, but in this, in this case here, a cognitive IoT system will allow us to understand that. Um, so some of the technologies that are in place uh, to enable this for us, um, Autodesk Forge, Project Dasher, IBM Bluemix, IBM Maximo, the Watson platform for the cognitive AI system, uh, Model Stream, Archibus, things like that for the asset management and BIM integration. And, and you know, the, the key takeaway here is that, you know, um, IoT and cognitive research is focused on operations. However, BIM has been proven to be a component of operations and looking towards the future 
it's going to be a major component in the next five years. So we need to leverage both of those things. We need to understand where and where the physical device is located and what is it connected to, i.e., what are the systems. And, and really, you know, you know that no matter how smart uh, an, an artificial intelligence system is or a cognitive system is, um, human interaction is still required. Um, human interaction is still needed to be a part of the equation uh, going forward. So, you know, in this case here, you know, um, this, is, this is an example of how an AI and a 3D model work together. So an, an AI system de determines that a, that a device will fail. The work order is created. A 3D map of where the component is located is generated. And then the crew gets shown exactly where the component is that needs replacement. And then BIM plus augmented reality, in this case here, it's the Daiquiri Smart Glasses. Um, when you look at the device, it's going to show you exactly which way to turn the valve. Um, and it's going to show you um, where, where the flow rates are, what the flow in, is for the, the piping, uh, what the flow rates are. And then as you close the valve, it'll change the flow rate so you know that the valve has actually been, been shut. So what are we looking at here? So we're looking at a world in the, this asset management of 21st century is where devices, people, and processes are connected to each other, a world where devices are able to inform us of their state, meaning am I operating, or am I out of bounds, am I under operating under normal conditions, a world where the AI systems can predict failure based upon analytics and trends and real-world conditions, a world where the digital twins allow us to explore new what-if scenarios before we actually make changes in the real world. So if I change my piping from two inches to three inches, what's the impact? We can analyze that using the digital twin. Uh, a world where human intelligence is supplemented by machine learning and insights a world where the risk, cost, and opportunities are balanced through a complete understanding of the factors that affect operations. And this is really asset management in the 21st century. So I want to thank you for your, your time. I appreciate every, your, uh, your attention during this, uh, this day. And I want to give a big shout out to England. Good luck tomorrow against Croatia. We're rooting for you. Uh, I know you're going to do fantastic. And so um, I encourage you to take a look at our website for upcoming events. Um, if you want to see more about ModelStream and some of our videos, you can go to um, microdesk.com slash playlist. Uh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter. Um, my email address, gbroadbent at microdesk.com. Please reach out to us and, uh, um, for anything that you need. I thank you for your time. Have a wonderful day.